Good morning, everyone. Yeah, this keynote uh, was proposed to me three years ago, so I've been waiting three years to give this keynote as well. Um, yeah, I want to talk about Puma today. So um, if you don't know, I am kind of the main maintainer of the Puma web server project. Um, I've been doing that since 2017, I think, um, about five years now. And it's been something that I've been doing almost as long as I've been doing my main gig, which is SpeedShop. Uh, it's the name of my Ruby on Rails performance consultancy. I make Rails apps faster, more scalable, and help you to stop pulling your hair out every time you have too much traffic. Um, and as I started writing about this and writing online about how to make a Rails app more scalable, um, the original author of Puma, uh, Evan, approached me to make me, he's like, uh, hey, Richard, also um, the maintainer, hey, can you help me maintain this Puma project? And I said, yeah, sure. So this is my, my plug. <laughs> um, if you want me to keep maintaining Puma, or you want to say thank you for using Puma in your project, you can buy one of my things on Gumroad. Uh, I have a bunch of courses and books about Sidekick, Rails, uh, Ruby. But anyway, back to Puma. So uh, the Puma project is a Ruby web server designed for, for parallelism. We used to say concurrency, now we say parallelism. That's, that's what's at the top of the, the readme, right? It's the Ruby web server, it's the parallel one. Um, we've been the default for Rails for a while now, since like Rails 4 or 5 when they made Action Cable a thing. Um, and since then, it's been hugely, hugely popular. Um, we're now the most downloaded Ruby web server. We're like the, hot, the most popular by number of downloads. Um, and uh, it's been a true honor to be able to maintain kind of like a top 100 gem by download count. Um, we're up to two, almost 250 million, so I think like if you download, if you're the 250 millionth download, we could like, you know, <laughs> make your like console explode with like a little surprise or something. Um, but uh, it's been a, a pretty amazing journey. So I got into OSS contribution um, because I was alone. <laughs> I was a junior developer that was like two years into their career, and I was the lead developer at this startup, which meant I was the only developer at this startup, and uh, I had no one to review my code. So I went and started contributing to Rails because you get Rafael Franca, one of the best Rails engineers in the world, to review your code for free. Um, so for me, OSS contribution, and specifically I want to make contribution to Puma, it should be fun, and you should be able to learn a lot from it. And I think Puma is a great project to help you to have your contribution meet these, these, these two goals. And it's my job, I think, as the maintainer to make this happen. Um, but really, uh, as a maintainer, I think my philosophy is, maybe, maybe comes off as one is of, of laziness. I want other people to do the work for me. <laughs> I, I'm not the kind of maintainer that is trying to like hero mode, you know, uh, push out thousands of lines of code every day, and Jeremy in the front row is laughing because he, he knows that he's more of this style, or he, Jeremy is so prolific, it's amazing, I can't do that. Um, so my style of maintainership is more of trying to see myself as like creating a community, to build a community of Puma maintainers, to build this army of nerds that will help me to uh, maintain the Puma project and to help it go into the future. Um, so that's what I'm here to do today. I'm here to build the army. Um, I want you to all contribute to Puma. And when I say that, I know most of you in this room probably either have never contributed to open source before, or maybe you're maybe contributed one or two things, or maybe you have your own repo on GitHub, but it's like a personal thing. You haven't contributed to a big project like Puma. Um, one of the big things I hear is like, oh, I don't know like there's a, there's a hump you're trying to get over of like, I don't know what the project does. I'm intimidated. I don't know what, what it, how, to, how, to, how to contribute. I don't know anything about your project. How can I do something useful? Well, I'm here to remove that excuse from you today. Um, I think Puma is a great place to get started contributing to open source. Um, and as a little prize, I want to tell you, the thing we do at Puma is if you are the person that made the most contributions, to a major or minor release. We let you name it. So there's a little log message when you start Puma that says, 
some name. Uh, and if you have the most contributions, we let you set that message. So that gets seen by, I don't know, probably millions of people um, for as long as that version is out. So a little prize for you if you decide to become a big contributor to Puma. But I get it. Puma is complicated. It is not simple. Um, it's short. We're going to get into how it's something like 5,000 lines of Ruby and 4,000 lines of native extension code. It's not like a huge project by any metric, but it is complicated, and it uses concepts that you probably are not familiar with uh, from your day job in Ruby, because most of us are web application developers, um, so it, it deals with some different concepts. But there's a lot of stuff I'm going to cover in this presentation. There's a lot of new concepts, a lot of things that I'm going to go through really, really quickly at a high level, but if you remember just 10% of this, I promise you know more than I did five years ago when, when Evan made me the maintainer. So um, this is intended as a very brief overview, and it's not intended for you to like, oh, now I get it. Now I understand how Puma works. Um, I, I, this is just kind of an intro to get you uh, interested and uh, a broad overview of Puma. So this is my agenda. Um, first, I want to talk about the design goals and purpose of Puma, why it's architected the way it is. Uh, and then we want to talk about processes and threads. It's kind of the bare bones of how any web server works and threads specifically with how Puma works. Then I want to walk through some specific bits of code. And then I'm going to talk about contributing to Puma. And that's going to be not only applicable to Puma, but also how do you contribute to any OSS project. OK, Puma's design goals. Um, Puma was designed as the web server for the Rubinius project. Rubinius was an old. Ruby implementation, uh, written also by Evan, that didn't have a global VM lock. We're going to get into more about that later. But it means that Ruby could run in parallel. So he needed a web server to show off, hey, look at this super parallel Ruby implementation I wrote. Um, so it, it was going to have parallelism involved. Second, it was going to be batteries included. Puma as a project, you should just be able to start a Puma server and then be ready to go. You can run your Rails application, show it off to the world. We don't want to have, you have to, to run any other stuff with Puma. Third, I want to add less than a millisecond of overhead to every request. This is actually a really conservative goal, um, but it's kind of a, the goal that's in the back of my head for Puma's performance. And then fourth, I want to stay simple. So I want Puma to be a, a small project, not to have tens of thousands of lines of Ruby code, um, and just to stay small. What is a web server, though? A web server is an application that accepts connections on a socket and then serves HTTP applications over those connections. So new concepts, sockets, HTTP, OK? So HTTP, you probably have some familiarity with that, but a socket may be new to you. Sockets are endpoints for streaming data to and from clients. They're identified by this combination of the, the IP address that you're sending data to and from, and then a port. Um, so there's a source and a destination IP address and a source and a destination port. That's a socket. Uh, we create uh, a file descriptor for every socket. And in Puma, we have three different types of sockets. We've got TCP, Unix, and SSL sockets. Puma mainly uses the TCP socket and Unix socket classes directly out of the standard library. So you just require the socket class you just uh, call dot gets like you would on the terminal, you know, like gets dot chomp or whatever. Like that's you getting output from standard I.O. This is the same thing, but you're getting it from a TCP socket. And then we close the socket at the end. Uh, so we close the socket, tell the client, okay, we're done, get out of here. Then what are we sending over the socket? We're sending HTTP. That's an application layer protocol in the OSI model. Puma only speaks HTTP 1.1, which is a uh, 1.x, so 1.0 and 1.1. It's a very simple protocol. You have a, a, a verb, get. You have a path, so this image is path. We, have a, uh, we tell what the server what version we, we're, we're talking. Then we've got some headers and values, and then we've got a message. OK, that's HTTP. What is Rack? Puma is also a Rack server. So a rack server is just a type of web server. It's a subset of web servers that serve rack-compatible applications written in Ruby. Okay, So we have web servers. Most all web servers will serve HTTP. And some of those are also rack servers. Puma is a rack server. Rack applications are very simple. 
RAC, app, RAC is a, a very elegant standard. It's a pleasure to like, work with. Every time I have to go in there, I'm very thankful for all of Jeremy and, and Co's work on, on maintaining RAC. It's very simple. It's an object, responds to call, returns an array with three values, a status, some headers, and then an, uh, a response body. Um, the simplest possible RAC application is therefore just a proc. It's a proc. You give it an argument, which is the rack environment. We're going to talk about more, that more in detail. And that, that uh, object responds, um, retur that proc returns an object with the, the three things that I just talked about. Then it's our rack server's job to turn this into bytes on a socket that go back to the client. So our job as Puma is the interface between those two worlds. So you define a rack application, usually in a rack up file. Um, rack up files look like .ru. Uh, in Rails, it's config.ru. It's also, config.ru is like the configuration for the default. So if you don't specify what application you're running, Puma looks for a config.ru file like this and says, whatever argument you gave to run, whatever parameter you gave to run, I'm gonna call that the application and that's the, the object I'm gonna uh, call. So I said we have to give this application an argument. That argument is the environment hash. Um, it is literally a huge hash with a bajillion keys in it. The rack spec specifies what these keys are. Um, there's specific ones that we must provide. There's some like optional ones that we can provide. Um, and that environment is the only parameter, really. Like that's, that's, the, that's the input to our function, the output being that, that three value response. So it's actually like a really simple standard, very elegant. Um, and like I said, Puma is the interface here. It's the interface between a rack compatible Ruby application and a client connected over a socket. Our job is to take a socket, convert it into, read the HTTP to coming down off the socket, provide the rack environment to the application, get the response back, turn that back into bytes that we send down on the socket. So here's our mental model so far. We've got a socket. The socket contains an HTTP message. The HTTP message gets turned into this rack environment hash. The rack environment hash goes to the application. Application spits out the response with some output, and we put that output back onto the socket as bytes, as an HTTP formatted response, okay? So Puma, like almost all Ruby web servers, is what's called a pre-forking web server. Um, I don't know if it was actually originally designed this way, but uh, we added this feature later. We call it cluster mode. And in a pre-forking web server, you start one process. We call this the parent process. And in the parent process, we boot the application. So we call rails.application.initialize or whatever it is. And we start the application. It's ready to receive a request. We listen on the socket. It's very important. And then we call fork. And what fork does is it creates a new process, which is a child of the parent process. So it's like a copy. And we create however many you told us to create. And then the parent process stops listening on the socket. And the child processes are all listening to this one socket, and they all will respond to any new connections that come down on the socket. I keep saying socket, but really it's, a, it's the port. And we create connections on the sockets on the port. So after the app boots, child processes serve requests, and the parent does not. The parent process just kind of sits there. It has its own job doing its own thing, does not respond to web requests. Um, it's to, that parent process's job is to receive signals, like when you control C in your terminal. You're sending that to the, map, the, the parent process, which then distributes that signal to all the child processes. So this is, this is Puma cluster mode, is what we call the pre-forking mode. Um, we control this with the worker argument in the, uh, in the terminal, so if you provide W4, that means that a parent process will start, create four child processes with the fork system call, and then those four child processes are what is responding to any connections to port 3000 or whatever you configured, okay? So at this point, this is now our mentor mo mental model. We have got a socket with multiple child processes connected to the socket, and the child processes, each one of them will uh, take an, a new uh, HTTP connection, turn it into a rack environment, 
provide the rack environment to an application, call the application with the rack environment, send that response back, okay? So we've got a bunch of child processes connected to one thing. Then we've got the thread pool. This is the Puma special sauce, okay? This is what we do that other web servers don't do. Uh, we've got, in every single child process, one thread pool. The thread pool can have one or it can have 100 threads. And each of those threads in the thread pool is consuming work from a array. Uh, so this is pseudocode. This is what it, isn't what it actually looks like. We've got an array of work to do, and we've got a thread pool. And that thread pool is full of threads that are running this code that is block that consumes the work to do array. So I haven't included that implementation, but that block that consumes method is just pulling stuff off of the array and doing it, okay? So we add work to do to that array, and then those threads, which are running in the background, pop stuff off of that array and do it, and do whatever it says to do, okay? That's essentially how Puma's thread pool works. Now, threads, we've got a global VM lock, right? The global VM lock allows only one thread to run Ruby code at a time. Well, shit, that sounds really useless then, because if only one thread can run Ruby, then what's the point of having a threaded server? Well, uh, if you ever flown to a different country and you sit in the line waiting for a border agent, right? Imagine each border agent, there was only one fingerprint machine and they had to pass the fingerprint machine around to each, each uh, border agent. Those border agents have other stuff to do than take your fingerprints, right? They can do that work in parallel. So the GVL is a lot like that. Uh, there's one thing that we can do only at one, one person can do it at a time. But there is something that Ruby processes do which is not running Ruby code, and that's waiting. So waiting on the database, waiting on an external third-party HTTP call, um, waiting on your mail server to come back with a response. These things are all just waiting on I.O. We can do these things in parallel with multiple threads at the same time. So even though we can't run Ruby at the same time, we can still parallelize a lot of the workload. Now it's more complicated nowadays. Um, in Ruby 3.0, we have Raptors. So there kind of is no global VM lock anymore. Each Raptor has a VM lock. So each Raptor can run code in parallel. Um, so I, I, I say global VM lock, I'm just putting this slide up to tell you, it doesn't actually exist anymore, but effectively, there, Puma only runs in one Raptor. There's only, we, we, we still have a VM lock that prevents us from doing stuff in parallel. This is all Ruby implementation specific, okay? That global VM lock is not a feature of the language. Um, it's something that's just an implementation detail in CRuby. Truffle Ruby doesn't have it, JRuby doesn't have it. Um, so that limitation is specific to CRuby and uh, that's it. But even with that limitation, a Puma process that's running an application that waits on I.O. for about 50% of its total time uh, in MRI with four threads in the thread pool can process two times as many requests as a server with one thread. So two, for example, unicorn processes running this application can process the same amount of requests per second as one Puma process. This is Puma's primary benefit. We have more throughput for the same amount of memory resources or the similar amount of memory resources. So if you have two unicorn processes and you switch it with one Puma process and four threads, you should see the same amount of requests per second for the average application at a much lower memory usage. This is the reason to switch to Puma. If, if this doesn't matter to you, like, don't, don't switch to Puma, there's no point. Um, so, at this point, now our mental model is we've got the thread pool. So we still got our, our, our port, we've got a child process, we're turning HTTP into a rack environment, and then once we've got that rack environment, we're gonna throw it into the thread pool. We're gonna say, here's the request for the rack environment, one of you threads, go run this application. One of you threads, call app.call environment and then give me a response. We've got this other class in Puma called the reactor. And the reactor's job is to buffer requests 
so that only complete requests are sent to the thread pool. This prevents slow clients like big uploads or bad actors from monopolizing our thread pool. Imagine if you sent me one byte of a request and then just stopped. What, should my thread sit there and wait for your request? No, we want instead to offload that work to the reactor. Now Unicorn, intentionally, from a design perspective, doesn't have a reactor. They said, we don't want to deal with this. Instead, you should use Nginx or Apache and put it in front of Unicorn to buffer those requests for you. But Puma design goal, we don't want you to have to do that. So we're going to include the reactor and do that buffering for you. OK, so at this point, this is our final model. We've got multiple child processes listening to the, the port that you told us. Uh, we've got a reactor in each process that takes that raw socket data, turns it and buffers it into a complete rack environment. The rack environment gets passed to one of our many uh, threads in the thread pool. So this is the final model of what Puma looks like when it's running. When I'm uh, looking at a new project for the first time, one of the things I like to do is to use this tool called Clock, which is CLOC, it just counts the lines of code in the project. And I like to figure out what are the really big files, because usually those are the important ones. And the, there are a number of sort of god object classes in Puma that are pretty big by lines of code. So um, I want to talk about some of those bigger classes in Puma and explain what they do and why they're important. Uh, probably the biggest thing by lines of code of Puma is the ext directory. Uh, it's our, our native extensions. You can kind of guess what they do based on those file names there. Um, parse HTTP and do SSL. And we've got stuff in C and uh, in Java. So um, there's something like three, 4,000 lines of this stuff. Um, so almost as much non-Ruby code as there is Ruby code in Puma. Um, and we roll our own SSL implementation. So it's a little weird. We don't actually use the default open SSL, like require open SSL, or whatever it is for the standard library in Ruby. We have our own mini SSL thing. And this was originally done as a performance implementation. We kind of want to get rid of it, but it's still there. So we've got this C code that does SSL stuff for us. We use open SSL underneath, of course, but like the interface to Ruby is, is custom. And then we have an HTTP parser based on Zed Shaw's work on Mongrel. Mongrel was like the original Ruby application server. Like this was uh, what Twitter was deployed on in 2010 or whatever before they switched. Um, and the parser of that lives on in both Puma and Unicorn. Like if you look at both projects, there's a copyright Zed Shaw statement on the, on the parser code. So um, it's kind of a way that Unicorn and Puma are like long lost brother and sister projects. And that parser uses a, a Puma's like one system dependency called Regal. And Regal is a library for creating state machines and parsers. Uh, and it looks like this, um, this kind of code, which looks very similar to what you see in an HT, like the RFC for HTTP itself, uh, defines like, this is what a control character is, this is what a safe character is, et cetera. Um, and we are in dire need of help <laughs> with, this, with this native extension stuff. Um, I am not a C programmer, I don't pretend to be one, uh, and I'm certainly not a Java programmer. So um, if you have experience in any of these areas, we really, really could use your help. Um, so uh, my, my, my not so subtle plea for Java and C people in this room would be, please take a look at our extension code, because we could really, really use some eyes on it. Okay, so outside of the native extension code, these are some of the most important Ruby classes in the Puma project. We've got server, cluster, cluster worker, runner, and thread pool. These are like the beating part of Puma. Like this is the circulatory system that gets everything started. It's where the main loop kind of gets created and uh, it's the main place that determines how a Puma server works. So. First thing we do is create a runner class. We create an instance of a runner, and it's either one of the two subclasses. We have a cluster subclass and a single subclass. So cluster creates you know, the four worker mode, and if you have zero workers, we call that single mode. So there's no parent process, it's just one process, we never call fork. That runner object creates one server object. The server object has one thread pool, so it's all one, one, one. 
And in the runner, the, I'm using the single runner here as an example because uh, it's a lot simpler. We uh, bind to all the sockets you told us to. We talk to the launcher object, which I'm going to talk about later. Create, but the main thing here is creating the server object. And we call server.run, and at the end here, we wait on the server thread. And we say, server thread, do your thing, and when you exit, we'll exit. So the runner's job is really just creating the, the, uh, the server object. I'm not going to show the cluster run method because it's like 20 times longer. It really needs to be refactored. But it's more complicated because it has more work to do. Um, a, a cluster worker needs to set up signal handling. So that's one cool concept you get to learn about in Puma is Unix signals. Um, we have to preload the application. So that has to, uh, we do that for copy on write memory. Another cool thing you get to learn about if you contribute to Puma. And that server object that these runners create, um, their main job is to create a thread pool and create a reactor and then listen to the socket at the end. Um, so the thread pool and the reactor, we're going to talk about more later. Um, but really, the main point of the server is to call run and then call this, this handle servers method. And that handle servers method is really what I would consider like the main loop of Puma. So in handle servers, um, if we are not currently shutting down, so if we're running, um, we call io.select. And io.select is like the building block of all servers, really, not just web servers. But most servers are spending some time calling io.select and then calling accept non-block or whatever the system call is in their server um, and accepting connections off of this socket. So io select. Io select takes an array of io objects, calls the select to system call, and then waits until one of those io objects is available for reading and then returns that io object back. Okay? So you can have multiple different ports or multiple, you can have a port and a Unix socket that you've bound to with Puma. And when one of those is ready for reading, it pops out of io.select and then we continue on in the code. That io object that gets returned from io.select then, we call accept non-block on that object. And we take the, the, that method takes the first connection out of that queue on the io object, creates a new socket, returns the socket object, and then it's in the name. It doesn't block. So we just keep going, keep moving on after that. So we're not trying to read bytes off of the socket at this point. That happens, that happens later, OK? Then the thread pool. So we take the, the socket, and we pass it off to the thread pool. The thread pool, uh, we can spawn threads. We spawn the number that you tell us to spawn. That's kind of what you would expect. And then each thread in the thread pool takes work off of the array, to, we shift off of the to-do array, that's the work we have to do, and then we call a block. So you start the thread pool with a block, you say, for all work things, call this block with the work as arguments. Okay, config. How do you configure this whole process? We've got a couple of classes for configuring that server, launcher, all the stuff I just talked about. CLI, launcher, DSL, binder, and configuration. This is the stuff that starts Puma and tells it how to run. Um, so the CLI is the kind of interface that you're used to. When you call Puma, Puma-W4, the CLI is what gets created. Uh, it's created by bin Puma. That creates a configura configuration object based on user input. The launcher object is created with that config. And finally, the launcher creates a binder and a runner. So, Bin Puma is the entry point for all of this. It's extremely simple. It's like three lines of code. We require Puma CLI, we create a new CLI object, and then call run on it. So that's the only thing that's in our like bin stuff. It's the only thing that actually we, we, we call. In the uh, CLI object, we create the launcher object and then just call run on it. So really like the whole process of CLI and, and bin Puma is just like passing straight through into the, the launcher object. So those are like coordination classes, and launcher is kind of where the main logic occurs. I talked about how launcher creates binders and runners. Binder is kind of a nice self-contained class. Binder's job is to, to open uh, the port, like say port 3000 or the Unix socket, whatever you said uh, to do, that's binder's job. So binder creates the open ports, whatever. 
create runner creates the type of runner you told us to create. If, you, if we're doing cluster mode, we create the cluster runner. If it's single mode, we create the single runner. Then we call launcher run. And launcher run just does a bunch of setup stuff, but really all it does is call runner.run on the runner. So we're passing through now from the launcher back into the runner class that we already discussed. And then when we're done, when the runner is done and we turn control to this method, the launcher does some cleanup. We want to be a good citizen on the operating system and close our sockets, get rid of the file descriptors, etc. Okay. Finally, we've got the request response classes. And these are the classes that manage a single connection in Puma. These are the classes that are like, after the Puma server started, these are the classes that are doing most of the work. And those are reactor, client, and request. So the thread pool, going back to the thread pool, those worker threads, their job is to call server process client with a client object. Each connection is represented by a single client object. This adds the client to the reactor, and when the client is fully buffered, request creates that rack and calls the app and writes the response. So connections are clients, clients get put in the reactor to be buffered, then once they're buffered, we use request to create that rack environment. So in server process client, got a meth, I've got the text of the method here, we add it to the reactor and then exit. When this gets called again later and the client is ready, we uh, handle the request and uh, that handle request method is what ends up calling the application. The reactor, basically all the reactor does on a client object is it just calls try to finish over and over on the client object. And that method is actually really simple. It looks long, but it's really simple. You read from the socket, you add the data on the socket into this buffer string. So each client has this buffer string that you add data onto. And then when we send that data to the parser, which is the, that's our native extension right there. And then when the parser says, hey, I'm done, this thing is parsed, then we, we're done and we can go back and create the request. Inside of that handle request method, after the, the request is parsed, we call the app. That's that code, that pseudocode I was, you know, putting up on slide five or whatever. It's right there at app.call. It's that simple. Um, and then once we call the app, we send the response back with that prepare response method, clean up a bunch of stuff, get rid of our IO buffer, blah, 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 and just clean up our, our state. And then rinse and repeat to infinity. That's it. It's that simple. I just talked through 10,000 lines of code in 10 minutes, and you all completely got it. <laughs> yeah, that was so simple. You all are 100% experts now. That wasn't the point. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of how does a web server work, how does Puma work, um, and really, if you just went back and, and you could kind of use this as a blueprint to implement any web server in, uh, in, in Ruby. Okay, let's talk about contributing. Um, I, I love, by the way, this is all my images, if you noticed, are mid-journey. I love how it does text. Like, it's just like, this, this poster originally says we can do it, but now it's just like So, in the main Puma repository, we've got contributing.md, and this is our guide to how to contribute to Puma. Um, at the top of contributing.md, it says, if you get stuck, just book time with me, and I've got like a Calendly link there. So, I try to be radically generous with my time on Puma, and if you need 30 minutes to get on Zoom and talk through like, hey, my brew install isn't working, like I'm happy to do that with you. Please grab some time with me and let's get you to the state where you can contribute on Puma. Happy to answer any questions that way. Or if our time zones don't line up, you know, I'm located in Tokyo, so maybe it's difficult for us to get some time, um, you can just use GitHub discussions. But Setting up Puma is actually really simple locally. We clone the repo. You have to install Regal. So I talked really briefly on that one slide about the Regal dependency. You do have to install that locally when you're developing Puma. Um, and then you have to compile that extension yourself. Normally that's taken care of for you by Bundler, but when you're developing locally, you have to do it yourself with Bundle Exec Rake Compile. And then just run Bundle Exec Rake to run all of our tests. Then once you've got all that done, you can use your local Puma copy to serve applications. So 
the first line is like just serving a, um, a basic like test application, but in your Rails application, you can change the path of where the Puma gem is coming from to your local copy of Puma, and then you can serve you know, your local Rails app with this Puma uh, copy that you've got you know, cloned wherever you cloned it. So you can mess around with Puma and then use it on your day-to-day -day, uh, Rails app. One quick thing that's a pet peeve of mine with OSS contribution is I see beginners want to claim issues. So they, they really don't want to like work on something that someone else is working on. Don't comment that you want to claim something. Just post a draft PR. Now that we have this on GitHub, it's so much better. Just work on some code, post a draft PR, and then I'm happy to help you once you've got some, some code committed and you um, are ready for uh, some feedback. But when it comes to contribution, it's not just about pushing new code. I think, oops, initially we always want to like get into the hero contribution. We want to like push the big new feature for Puma and version 6.1, uh, but that's like the worst place to start. So instead, I want to guide you through some places I suggest you start. First of all, Puma has a contrib wanted label. So these are issues that I think are good for people that are looking to contribute. It means that they're very defined. They have a clear next action step. Um, usually they don't require that much context and they don't have that big of a scope. It's not like they're gonna require 2,000 lines of code to fix. It's like, okay, this is probably a small defined project. Then, point two, I suggest you take a look at the needs repro label. This is another like unique thing I like to do where if we've got a bug report that doesn't yet have like clearly reproducible steps, I throw this label on it. It's a great opportunity to contribute because finding a repro is actually really hard. Like this is where most bug reports go to die. So if you can help the reporter out by reproducing their issue, then someone who knows more about the project can go in and fix it really quickly usually. So that's a huge help to us even if you don't submit the bug fix. Then there's the docs label, kind of self-explanatory, but uh, we, I think docs is a great place to start in a project because you're basically going in, learning about the project, and then documenting your learning for other people. So it's a great non-code contribution that really helps out the project, it helps out other people who would like to contribute. And then um, another thing I think I'm a little bit radical on, at least in Puma, is that I don't think code review is just for me. I, th I appreciate code review from anybody, not just people who are quote unquote maintainers of Puma or have like the green button merge privilege. Um, if you can go into a PR you know, on GitHub, they allow you to do this now, to add review comments to any PR, please do that. Like be constructive and you know, do, be nice, but I love having PRs reviewed by other people that are not maintainers of the project. Then uh, I suggest fixing bugs. So we also just have the bug label, and that means that we have a reproducible bug that you can fix. I think that's a better place to start than a feature because uh, it's more defined. It's like, okay, this thing is broken. It should do this. It doesn't do that. Make it do that thing. So they usually are, are much, require much less work. It's like a 20, 30 line fix. Um, that's where I would suggest going next. Finally, after you've done a few of those things, I think like three or four times, I would suggest looking at our features label. We get these requests all the time, of course, and most of them are actually like pretty big projects. So it's not something I suggest starting on because it usually requires the most amount of work from getting started to getting it merged. So um, it's, I appreciate any contribution, but I think features is probably the last place you should start. So this is, this is my suggested list in order, and I wanna point out that this is not really Puma specific. I think this is a good OSS contribution strategy for anybody that's looking to get started on OSS. Um, not every project has the exact labels that Puma has um, with contrib wanted and needs repro, but those issues do exist, right? So you have to read the issue tracker yourself um, and figure out which of these issues are are matching that state. Finally, um, if this presentation has got you interested and you want to learn more about how to contribute to Puma or the concepts behind Puma, I suggest checking out workingwithruby.com. It's a bunch of uh, free books written by Jesse Stormer about five or six years ago, but they're still really applicable today about how to work with sockets and things like that. It's really great material. Go read the rack spec. It's really short, um, really interesting, quick read. Um, 
And that's it. So thank you very much for your time. And I um, hope to see you on GitHub.